and she really has a long-term view of recovery. You know, she does not give up on the people that come through her courtroom if they relapse. She sees it as an opportunity to help them further their recovery. Um, and But she also doesn't put up with people, you know, selling drugs among the other participants. She's pretty, Judge Keller is pretty, um, she's kind of like that. As weird as that sounds, the facade is kind of Judge Keller. She's, uh, we've spent an a crazy amount of time with her at this point, and she's just kind of always like that. She's just mm -hmm. a very um, positive, I've never heard her complain, um, very positive, very focused, pretty even kill person. She's not, nothing really upsets her too much or excites her too much, and and she just has a long-term view of this. She sees these, these participants as people that um, have an opportunity to contribute to the society there, and she helps them do so. And so what you don't see in the film is drug court treatment team. So what you see is when they meet with her, right? So one-on-one. -on -one. But for two hours before they meet with her, they actually, um, everybody on drug court treatment team, which includes people from the homeless shelter, people from the university, people from medical school, all these different places, comes together and talks about each individual participant and how they were that week, and they make a plan before they go into the courtroom. So. In that, you really see the struggle. The reason that didn't make it in is there's a lot of personal information sure. that's revealed in those moments that we weren't comfortable with uh, revealing. So, but yeah, she's a great, I mean, drug courts are totally dependent on the judge. Um, the drug courts that function well are, are working because the judge is committed. This is a volunteer position. No one's paid to be a drug court in Cabell County, West Virginia. And I don't think that, I think that's true for the entire state. Um, and so it's a volunteer position. She's a family court judge, and it's, yeah. So you have to have a heart for um, wanting to improve your community through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, am I correct in assuming that the fire department is on the front lines of this issue in Huntington? And if that's the case, why is it the fire department? The fire department. Is that normal? Yeah, not really. The fire department is always typically the first person there because they have so many stations around the city, whereas Cabell County EMS covers the entire Cabell County. So they're in Barbersville, they're in other towns. And so they're often not the first person on scene. It kind of varies, though. It depends on which part of the city it, it happens in. But Huntington Fire Department is spread out all over the city. So uh, it often makes them the first on scene. Yes. Did you know you were going to focus on the three women when you started, or did it kind of develop? Just developed into that. We first met Jan, um, and we went to Huntington because they were very transparent about their uh, numbers, the, the rates of addiction and overdose numbers, and we thought that that was something that we weren't seeing in other West Virginia towns. They were, they were being, having a very honest conversation about their problem and opening up to the media and to others in, in hopes of helping the city. Um, and so we had seen a lot of negative press come out of Huntington because of that openness, a lot of, um, a lot of aggressive media coming out. Um, and so we went in trying to better understand the people that were being so open, and Jan Rader was one of those because of Mayor Steve Williams' Drug Control Policy Board. She sits on that. And um, she introduced us to the other people, the other two women, but we filmed with many other people across Huntington. There's a lot of, there's a lot of amazing people working towards change there. Um, and also Morgantown too. We actually, we in the process of trying to find this film, we interviewed a lot of people across the state. Um, then we landed. We decided to focus on Huntington for the short. So, can I start asking Rebecca about some of her work? And if there's more questions, we can pop back in. Um, can you talk about the process of? Oh, first tell everybody who Wendy is. Sure. Um, and the process of earning her trust and, and the time you've spent with her, what you've sort of learned about addiction that you didn't understand before. Should have written that down. Sorry, that was a lot. I'll remind you. Uh, tell us about Wendy. Um, this is a topic that I've been really interested in. Um, I live in West Virginia. Um, my family is also touched by alcoholism uh, and suicide. And um, so I had been doing a lot of reading, uh, talking to people about the subject. And uh, that's how I first met Elaine. <clears throat> um, but when I saw that the Affordable Care Act uh, might be repealed, 
I really wanted to uh, learn more about how that would affect people in West Virginia, and specifically people who benefit from um, rehabilitation through the Affordable Care Act um, and Medicaid expansion. And uh, that led me to talking to people in the Eastern County, which is also hard hit. And um, I didn't go through a drug court, but I went through a day report center. And the woman there was uh, very open. She invited me in. And I met different people that were involved in that program. And I. It took me a while, really, to connect with somebody. At first, I thought I might um, spend some time with a young man. Um, but eventually, I ended up meeting this woman who's 50 years old who had a 12-year-old son. And I'm in my mid-40s, and I have a 12-year-old daughter. And um, we met, and it was just sort of one of those immediate connections, but that didn't mean the work was easy, and it didn't mean there weren't, um, there wasn't time that needed to be taken to really deepen a relationship that allows you to do work with some depth, um, work that allows you into people's lives um, so that you can show their layers, humanize them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you just recently saw Wendy, so you've been keeping in touch with her. What's been the yeah. biggest surprise or learning curve for you about addiction in West Virginia and, and the struggle that you've seen Wendy go through? Um, for me personally, um, the stories that I get invested in are with people that I feel a connection with. And so even though I may stop taking pictures, um, I stay in touch with people. And so Wendy and I would text or call. But actually, I went to DC to see a photography discussion recently and I stopped to visit her on the way back. Um, and I wonder about continuing and following up. Recovery, from what I've learned, is it's just not a one-time thing. It's, it's a lifelong process. And I can say from my own challenges in my life, they come up again and again. You know, Anybody who's fighting a demon, um, it's not something that, you know, wave a magic wand and you're better. Um, it's sometimes a lifelong struggle. So I've, I've learned that from spending time with people in recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're a documentary photographer. You live in Wheeling. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, just explain to people what it's like to be a documentary photographer in West Virginia, where you, where you find your income, where you find the happiness, your studio, sort of your setup. and. For, I'm sure there's some people in here who also make photos. Uh, it's also been a lifelong challenge to figure out how to be a documentary photographer. Um, it's not something that I have really found a way to generate income from. Um, so a lot of my income comes from working outside of West Virginia. I have a couple jobs that I get paid for within the state, um, but I work with a design firm in Pittsburgh that connects me with a lot of different nonprofits, uh, which I love. And they understand the way I approach photography, which is often in a documentary fashion. And, um, you know, it's good employment, which then gives me some time and space to devote to personal projects. Uh, people do not get into this line of work because they want to make money. Uh, they get into this line of work because it's a calling. Um, it, for me, it's just something that gnaws on me that um, I have to do. Um, and 
but it's difficult to figure out how to do, you know. Are there any questions? <laughs> any more questions? I can keep the conversation going. Is there a hand? Oh, sorry. I'm not familiar, <coughs> pardon me, with the term documentary photographer. How do you differ from a journalist, a, a, a news photographer? Mm -hmm. So uh, photojournalists would be reporting um, on the news and often on current issues. Um, that work would then be going directly to a publication. Um, you know, just Elaine can speak a little bit about the film. You know, as a documentary filmmaker, she was interested in a broad topic, wanted to cover it. I'm sure she had a very good proposal to Center for Investigative Reporting, but um, she wasn't publishing this for Netflix. That came much later yeah. in the process. Um, but in terms of the approach, um, you know, it's, it's actually, uh, I wouldn't say it's clean cut these days, documentary photography. But, um, you know, you're not typically staging things or directing. You're, I go as sort of a witness. That's how I feel comfortable in my role. A witness, but I'm also in relationship with the people that I'm working with. I also yeah. think that any documentary form cuts through the noise of 24-hour news cycle, news mm -hmm. in general. Like, we are inundated with news today. Um, and the great thing about, and that's why documentaries are so hard to make, is you have to sustain that over two years or longer to actually get the breadth of life you're trying to capture, right? So it takes a really long time to look at things, and nobody's willing to fund that. You know, no mm -hmm. one's willing. So you often do the work for a year by yourself before anybody comes on and those types of things are certainly part of the challenge and that's why it's so hard to make them but when they when the docs like so the like citizen four the documentary about edward snowden that that documentary played such a different role than all the really important news articles that were coming out daily about edward snowden's re revelations but that documentary is now uh, taught you know it's it's used in an educational form it's 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 so it's sort of the it's, it becomes the thing that lasts a little longer than our 24-hour news cycle, which is spitting things up and chewing, and spitting and chewing. So mm -hmm. whenever I hear, like we've been hearing today, like we heard Michael Moore's coming to West Virginia to document something. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think like some, doc some documentaries tend to spit and chew out things too, and sometimes when you, ha when you hear something like Michael Moore's coming, you kind of cringe a little bit because you're like, He's going to drop in for a week, and he's this big crew, and potentially, as the independent filmmaker, scoop the story that then no one's going to purchase from us later on, and we may be making all this in total vain. So that's the fear, you know, of, of being an independent filmmaker, is you can work a year on something, and you then start pitching it, and you realize someone more famous than you is also doing on the same topic. And, the market can only support the one person who's more famous than you. It's a really, it's a, actually a very, um, it's very, uh, you don't think about that when you're making it, and you only think about that when you're pitching it, and it's kind of scary because there's a lot to lose <laughs> um, of your time. And um, But yeah, no, I, I started in journalism and found that I was doing stories that would take longer, so I, I I was just was very turned off by this idea that I had to do three stories a day at a newspaper. I was like, I can't do anything of depth with three stories a day. Um, I can only report on what I'm seeing right then or what people are telling me right then. And, and so um, it was me trying to figure out how to report things on longitudinally. And thinking of your body of work, and it might be good mm -hmm. for you to talk about this, how do you think of your body of work as something that grows over time? You know, the stuff that I made in 2008, while it's not technically very good, like I wasn't great with a camera, it still is actually doing the same thing that this work is doing um, in many ways. It's, it's still around people and their fight and um, mm -hmm. understanding the individual and inner resilience, and those are the things that I'm drawn to. And so I mm -hmm. see the body of work growing even though it wasn't intentional. Do you have that 
same feeling or is yours a little bit more like do your tastes change and no I mean the different projects that I've worked on in this last year all kind of revolved around this topic um, including some work I have done of, about my own family uh, I think somebody Mike's arrived. here <laughs> come up here <laughs> keep talking Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so maybe maybe you can go in depth with um, one project. Maybe you go in depth by working, um, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, um, and then the culmination of the different uh, work provides um, breadth of knowledge across the theme. So, hi. Right. Good to be you? here. Good Sorry. I'm no, fine. you're fine. It was um, really hairy weather. Oh, was it? We're good. Right okay. Here, so. You came from Pocahontas County? Um, yeah, halfway. We, okay. we made a halfway point. So okay. Stopped. So this is Meg. Her work is also um, upstairs. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, where you live, <laughs> and how long you've been making um, photos? I'm Meg Ward. Um, I've been doing photography on and off for the past probably say 12 years but never really taking it that seriously until um, a few of my really good friends just were like hey you should do this more and it just it was one of those things where I was just like okay fine because I really enjoy it and it's really um, fascinating to me so why did you first pick up a camera uh, I first picked up a camera because <laughs> it was magic I mean why wouldn't I it's this ability to take a moment in time and capture it forever mm -hmm. and and that to me was just magic so yeah do you find that you're drawn to certain things or, um, or certain moments you know I don't really find myself looking for a certain thing no um, I think it's just beauty I don't know but beauty in an undiscovered kind of way mm -hmm. so. I described, when I was talking earlier, I described your work as gritty. I don't know if you would say that, but it just feels like... Yeah, um, there's definitely a gnarly aspect. Well, to no, it. It's, it, it, feels sure. like, it feels like you, you're the only person that could have shot that at that angle at that moment. Like, you're so present with... It's such... Yeah. The, every photo feels so... It has texture, and it feels yeah. like um, it happened naturally. Nothing feels posed. Nothing feels... That's a big thing for me. It's, it's pretty organic. I, I've tried... Um, and, and it's not that, I still do, every once in a while we'll do a shoot where I, it's a little bit kind of planned, but for me it's just, uh, it's a really organic, instantaneous sort of like, oh, that. And there's definitely moments in my life where I'm like, gosh, I wish I would have gotten that, you know? So kind of mm -hmm. obsessively carrying that camera around for that moment, so. What role does West Virginia play in your all's work? Like whether it's environment, landscape, or people, <laughs> spirit? You go first. <laughs> I pretty much grew up here. Um, I've lived, I've had the, I guess, the benefit of living in different parts of the state. My mom's from Wheeling. My dad's from Parkersburg. Hey, Dad. Um, <laughs> he lives in Huntington now. So I graduated from Huntington High. I went to college in the Eastern Panhandle for a couple years. And um, I've lived outside of West Virginia. Um, I left running at some point because I needed to be in a place where I didn't feel uh, so alone in my progressive thinking, I guess. Um, but, uh, and I lived on an island in the Caribbean for a couple of years, uh, which was torture. Sounds like it should be like amazing. but. I couldn't get over the fact that you just couldn't get on the road and go, yeah, you know? Yeah. And there's something about the hills that are rooted here. And I honestly still feel like I don't know what it is I will contribute here, but I want to contribute something. I want to contribute to the narrative of my state um, drawing from my experience as a West Virginian, 
And um, I hope that'll happen. Y'all say a prayer for me. <laughs> <laughs> Meg? I completely agree with a lot of what you said about having to kind of get away for a little bit. I definitely um, have ventured out oh, from the state. A little louder. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're fine. I am a little soft spoken. Sorry. I have definitely had to venture out from the state and to gain appreciation, I think, mainly. Um, because sometimes when you're in something for so long, you, um, I don't know, I don't want to say take it for granted, but you, um, I don't know, the zeal is gone for me. So, but I think, um, I think working in the state is a big part of what I do because I'm from here, but I've lived, like you said, in lots of different locations, like a lot. We moved a lot growing up, which I enjoyed. Um, but for me, I think there's, there's like little gems all over. So I, I enjoy being in the state and it's always different. That's the thing about it. You're not going to really go to a place and, and feel like, um, you've been there before. There's lots of diversity as far as like the landscape and the, and the people go. So. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, where are you from? I'm originally from Mingo, Wayne County, um, Hatfield, McCoy Territory, so. And Elaine, are you originally from Charleston? Or? I grew up in uh, Logan, and then I went to high school in Charleston. Yep. And there was another question here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so I'm curious how each of you, when you came to your, your instrument, your, your cameras, um, you may not have known had the skills to use them wisely. How have you grown? How have you, um, you know, you grown to use your instrument, and what has enabled you to expand your ability to use it in different ways? I'll start. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I used to think um, moving image was very complicated. Like I thought I needed to do a lot of things to make it look good, and I think over time I've stripped away a lot and just tried to get the rawest image possible which is the closest to the truth as possible so no lights we didn't light anything in heroin um, minimal disturbance to scenes um, trying to plant mics so that they're not hanging off people um, you know trying to trying to be as small and nimble as possible I mean Kern and I shoot together and so we we have matching cameras so that you know I, there's two cameras in many scenes one camera in some scenes and so for me it was I have I thought it was so important it was so intimidating it's so important to learn like the basics of lighting and some of these very complicated cinematography things but then I realized the stuff that I want to document doesn't always allow me to do those things and the the stuff that I want to document requires me to be more stripped down and more raw with how I'm um, you know like like these guys know, like riding on the back of tractors with a camera, like you're not gonna, you've gotta be holding on to the tractor, so you need one hand to focus, you know, do everything. So I think that's where I find my joy now, is like filming in extreme situations or in situations where it's challenging to get the shot and there's no retakes, and that's where I, I like it, that strip down style. That has been the, um that's where I've ended up too. Um, I pretty much use two cameras, uh, two lenses, and I even moved down from a professional body one because I can't afford it anymore. Um, but it's lighter. Um, I sacrificed my expensive lenses for cheaper lenses because I like to work long hours when I'm doing it, and whatever will make me not feel like I'm carrying around a lot of gear because um, that'll take away from uh, you know what's important which ultimately is the story and uh, the, the people so for me it's been about simplification in, in everything in my life I like wear the same thing all the time <laughs> it's super boring I'm like so dressed up you tonight. are like yeah. I, haven't, I haven't worn heels in five years <laughs> David you can attest to that so what about you what do you shoot on and what's your what's your what's your tool um, well being a self-taught photographer 
it was a lot of exploration um, with finding what I felt like was my niche. Uh, I still am trying to find what I, you know, I don't think that that ever is going to, I'm not ever going to be like, okay, this is it. I think I'm always going to want to grow mm -hmm. and, and find uh, a new, but right now I'm currently using two cameras, like you, like I'll usually have one loaded with color and one loaded with black and white or different lenses. Um, but. Yeah, for me it was a lot of exploration, lots of trial and error. Uh, I didn't take a photography class, I didn't go to a photography school, so it was just one of those things where you found it at a thrift stop, a thrift stop or a store and you're like, okay, I'm going to try it. And you take it home and you like it or it's crap and you, <laughs> you sit it on your shelf and it sits there. Yeah. But yeah, it was a lot of, lots of trial and error, ex exploration sort of thing, so. Cool. I want to I want to migrate to the exhibition. Does that make sense for everybody grabs a cookie? But I want to take any final questions for anyone. Do you want to say anything about the guys? I don't think so. I don't know. Oh yeah. For any and all of you, two things. What is your next project, and how did you discover it? Okay. Uh, my next project, um, uh, for 18 months we followed four guys in recovery. Um, they started at a six month farming based rehab in Aurora, West Virginia. And um, two of them are in the back. Um, <laughs> um, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, yeah, so what's, what's your old clean time now? Amazing. Great. Congrats, guys. Um, so um, I'm excited that it'll be coming out this year. I think Ryan's nervous. Are you nervous? Don't be nervous. Um, but yeah, we just followed. They were, I mean, it's an incredible opportunity to film someone from their first day of rehab to 18 months later, and I'm really grateful to all of them that let, I mean, there was no reason why any of them should have let us into their lives, and they did with open arms, and it was a pretty incredible journey. Um, so that'll be coming out later this year, and we're also working on a, a boxing series that my husband is directing. Um, we've been following uh, boxers in Ashland, Kentucky, and uh, in Eastern Kentucky and Southern West Virginia, professional boxers, trying to make a living doing that. Um, I've been working on a project about my sister. She lives in Athens County, Ohio, and all the people kind of who comprise her life. So I started that last spring. And um, I went to the Missouri Photo Workshop uh, this past fall, and um, at that workshop you have to find a story. and. I met um, some young girls who I connected with, and I've been back and I'm trying to figure out if it's a sustainable project right now. I, I care a lot about them and the subject, but just don't know how to make it work yet. Mm -hmm. oh, my, my next hopeful future project is um, to be documenting what my family has done for generations, but I feel like a lot of people aren't exposed to, which is a cemetery family reunion. It's where everyone, it's really popular where I'm from in the, in the coal fields, but it seems like not a lot of people do it anywhere else, but everyone gathers at this family plot cemetery, and they're there with the living and the dead, and it's like this big celebration get together. And, and over the years, I have taken some photographs of it, but it's something I really want to delve into deeper, just because I feel like it's something that's kind of disappearing, as far as like tradition and history goes in our state. So that's my next one. Awesome. Let's take a parade up to the exhibit and look at their work. I'm sure you have more questions for them. They'll hang around for yeah. a couple minutes and answer your questions. Thank you guys for being here. Hey. And please tell your friends and family the film Heroines on Netflix. So 
And you can host a community screening on our website, herointhefilm.com, under resources. There's an educational guide if you want to host a screening at any place. Um, it's, a, it's free for educational use. So thank you, guys. Hooray. Grab a cookie.